All right. Um, so first, let me thank you both for being here, taking the time out of your summer afternoon uh, to learn a little bit about how I teach my imperialism unit. Um, some background on me. Uh, my name is Max Commando. I am a uh, world history teacher and AP Gov teacher in New Haven Public Schools. Um, I'm at Metropolitan Business Academy and um, I've been there for about, I'll be going into my ninth year. So uh, I came in right when the district had reworked their modern world history um, curriculum. So I've kind of like grown with this unit over the course of the years. And um, I really, it's really my favorite thing to teach throughout the year. Um, I just find that I have the most student engagement um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about why I think that is. But um, let me share my screen and get rolling. So in, in talking with Jenny about how I kind of crafted this, um, the reason I, I like this unit so much is um, we really rely on what I think is a lot of visual literacy tools, um, which in, um, I mean, I, I know it applies to all districts, but in New Haven, when you have, I'm at a magnet school, so there's kids coming from lots of different towns and backgrounds and, and countries for that matter. Um, visual literacy, I think, is a really easy way to help deliver content, but also do it in a way that all students, regardless of ability or language barriers, can sort of have an entry point and feel successful in the classroom. And that's something that I think is really important um, for having a classroom where people feel safe to share ideas, to take risks, um, and to challenge themselves having an entry point where no matter what, they can feel successful on some level um, is I think step one. And documents and political cartoons um, can really, I think, support this. So um, just the introductions that I, I had said earlier, I'm a teacher at New Haven Public Schools, uh, specifically Metropolitan Business Academy, and I teach modern world history and uh, AP US government and politics. I had been teaching the world history class for seven, just strictly that, uh, for seven years. And last year was my first year uh, with AP Gov. So I've really had some, some opportunity to kind of tweak and refine. And, and every year I go back and do that in, um, for, for the modern world history. But this is sort of a little more of a finished product, I would say. So just a little bit of context um, for like where this is sort of situated in the year. Um, this is the um, six unit, I would call it six and a half because we have a little um, mini unit on world religions in between um, unit one and unit two. And I think that's important. It really, I think provides some, some context to specifically um, that comes back in this imperialism unit because religion is such a large part of imperialism. Um, but we're about you know four units in, so it's the back end of the year when this when this unit is happening. Um, students have gone over historical thinking skills. Um, we've talked revolutions. I think really they're largely Western Hemisphere revolutions. Um, after that, we shift to industrialism, and I think unit three and unit four are really um really closely linked you can't really have one without the other in my opinion and that's sort of how i teach the unit um, and we'll talk about how i started in a moment but um they are they're sequential they build on each other but they can also each be taught sort of in their own right which i like um and unit six my contemporary global issues is my ninth grade um research paper that um, students are, are researching sort of current issues. Uh, so some examples are, you know, do nuclear weapons make the world more or less safe? Um, issues about women's rights, uh, things like that. Uh, war and peace, leadership, globalization. That's kind of what unit six is. So we're all kind of building up. A modern world history um, should be 
starting around the year 1500 or, or 1492 as I kind of like to start it um, as the linking of of the continents really um, in earnest for the first time. So uh, we are we're about I usually teach this around I would say um, late February March is when we would start this. So that's sort of um, and and just that's sort of where it sits in the curriculum as a whole. And then um, this unit, my essential question um, is here is can imperialism ever be justified? So um, I really try to have sort of a compelling question or an essential question um, for each unit. And this these lessons are, are ultimately going to be. Um, used as evidence to answer this essential question which um irene i don't know if what you'll be doing tomorrow i know you said you've been doing these for a few days but to, uh, tomorrow is when we'll be talking about the assessment the summative assessment for this which where students will will answer um in what is what we call a structured academic controversy um using standalone documents um, as well as content from these lessons to answer and justify their que uh, this essential question. Where do they land on this? Can imperialism ever be justified? So if you'll look, um, I like to teach this unit, and I think it's a really effective way to teach it um, in through the lens of like case studies. So we look in particular um, first just with, with concept formation of um, introduction to imperialism and motivations for imperialism uh, with motivations we'll look at um, short little quotes and i'll have students sort of look at um, what do you think the the author of this quote is saying as why um, why is why imperialism is happening so we have quotes um, from prime ministers from bishops from from different people and students will kind of piece together this concept of, you know, it's very similar to how I teach sort of the age of exploration where the motivation is gold, glory, and God um, for, for colonization, sort of in a new lens and a new light. Then I'll move into case studies in particular. Um, as you can see, lessons three, four, and five are sort of case studies in um, imperialism in Africa. Lessons six and seven deal with imperialism in India. Um, and then lessons eight through 11, well, in particular, eight and nine is imperialism in China. Uh, and lesson 10 and 11 are imperialism through the lens of um, Imperial Japan, uh, starting with the Meiji Restoration. So it, it is a lot. It takes a long time. It's probably, you know, maybe a five, five week unit, sometimes more, depending on where we'll go, but that's sort of just the, the scope of, of this unit as a whole. So again, we talked about the case studies. I try to allow students to kind of jump from place to place. I think it mixes novelty, um, but also it allows for comparisons and, and contrasting the events. Um, how are they similar? How are they different? Um, and from from how I I've structured it, I, I kind of try to balance uh, the lens of sort of Euro European imperialism and then sort of indigenous or native resistance to that imperialism. So you know we talk about the Berlin Conference, but then we have um, you know successful, really the only successful African resistance um, during this time period with um ethiopia right and, and emperor menelik ii um of course there are other instances of um of african resistance there's there's you know it, it was happening the entire time but um using these little little case studies to drop in and take a look at um some successful and then less successful instances i think is a good balance for the unit um and helps, I think, students understand that imperialism is something that was always being resisted by those people um, in some ways in, in different forms. Um, you know, when we go to India, you can look at how people who were, were working with the British um, were both, you know, simultaneously resisting and, and 
collaborating, right? And, and what resistance can look like. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to those lessons in particular. But I think using these case studies is a good way for students to kind of think about them as dis discrete little um, segments. And then you can use that as, as an opportunity to compare and contrast. So also what I really love about this is um, political cartoons are, there's just so many of them about imperialism. Um, and this is how I would start my unit, right? So we had just, we would just, this is, this is you know, the first 10 minutes of class at, and in lesson one, um, I start with this cartoon, right? Um, and I try to use it to maybe activate some prior knowledge, um, again, as an entry point for students to no matter what your your reading level is right no matter how comfortable you are in the history classroom you can tell me what you see here right and by by having students feel like they can feel right even about the most basic things eventually you can sort of build them up to take greater risks um, in the classroom and grow as a student so this is what i would start with this would be my opener right so I try to use political cartoons in three different ways in this unit. I use them um, to sort of, some people call it a hook, some people call it an opener, some people call it a do now, whatever it is, this is how I would start a lesson with a political cartoon um, or an image. And usually it's some variation of what do you see? What do you think it means? Um, and then maybe a, a deeper question connecting to prior lessons, making inferences, um you know maybe projecting forward things like that so this is my attempt to sort of tie in like i said i think in industrialism and imperialism are linked um and so this is what i would say okay we just talked about in large part industrialism in england right so what is it that these places have that an industrialized england would want right what are these what are people in in these places what can they offer um, how might an industrialized England view the people there, right? And, and, and it just is a way to sort of start the conversation of talking about what imperialism is without necessarily starting with, okay, here's the definition of imperialism, let's, you know, memorize it, right? So it's a way for students to use this cartoon to sort of come to that realization, come to that understanding on their own. And then, of course, in the lesson, I do give them the definition and we do some readings and um, a little more explicit uh, connection between industrialism and imperialism. But so I, I like to use in, um, political cartoons in this lesson in three ways. Some as starters, some as, you know, openers, whatever. Um, some as tools for formative assessments for students. And then some as the driver of the lesson content themselves. Um, so you can kind of use them in different ways. Um, and again, just another example of what an opener would be um, for political cartoons on the Belgian Congo, right? We, we start with, um, so we've had the Berlin Conference uh, where there's a great picture of a group of, of, of men in a room staring at a map of Africa. Um, and I start the class that way by saying, all right, who do you think these people are? What do you think this meeting is about? Who do you see in this room? Who don't you see in this room? Right. Um, and that sort of is how we launched the Berlin Conference. Uh, from there, we would go to, to um, uh, an inquiry lesson about Ethiopia and successful resistance to that European imperialism. Um, and then this is where we would go next with the Belgian Congo. So, again, this is how I would start class about making inferences, um, making some guesses about the course of of king leopold and the belgian congo where that's going and what that's you know what that might mean for the people of the congo um and again in particular in the rubber coils starting to think about right what's the tie between industrialization um and, and sort of this new factory mass production what does that mean for um how is that tied to industrialization and imperialism? So these cartoons are really good access points and entry points for students to kind of start thinking about um, how imperialism looks in this place. So those are what I would use for, for openers. 
Um, lesson nine, and I would say that um, this is where I would use political cartoons really as the driver of content, right? Really as like the source, as the, the main bulk of the lesson. Um, and this is where I would be, you know, a little more um, direct in looking at what are the tools of political cartoonists, right? And, and having them really try to understand and, and not just go beyond what do you see, what do you think it means, but sort of peeking behind the curtain, so to speak, in terms of what are the tools that political cartoonists use to drive a message, right? So to sort of dial up the level of analysis. Um, and so I would do this, I do this through the lens of the Boxer Rebellion. Um, the Library of Congress is where I get these sources from. They are, there's, you know, dozens of them. It's really, really useful. Um, if you haven't ever used the Library of Congress as a, as a source for political cartoons, you can search a concept and look at, um, here, actually, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll pull it up, because um, I don't exactly remember what the search criteria was. Um, so, oh, yes, uh, photos, drawings, and prints, right? So those are really going to be, um, and you can see there are, you know, just on the first page, you know, dozen or, you know, tens of um, different political cartoons. And really what I would do is I, I'd have these around as a way to teach perspective and bias and some of these other, um, some of these other, other tools here. Let me actually X out of this for a moment. Slideshow. So, oops. Um, and for for this lesson, what we would do is we we um, is a brief lesson, a uh, brief little intro on the Boxer Rebellion, a short clip I have from your uh, the professor Yahuru Williams, and talks a little bit about a background. Um, and what I like about these cartoons is they're all done from uh, the Western point of view, right? So it really is able to see, okay, what are these Western countries? How are they reacting to their role in China, to their expectations, their goals in China? And how are they viewing this? You know, how is this being transmitted to the people of, of Europe and America in particular? Um, through the lens really of connecting to these five main elements. Then as a formative assessment, what I would do, since these are all from the Western point of, point of view, I have uh, students make their own political cartoon after having done these sort of five elements from the boxer point of view, from the Chinese point of view um, and, and how they're seeing it. So it's a way to, practice perspective, to practice, you know, bias, um, understanding and unpacking bias, um, and also give kids a fun, I think, creative way uh, to show what they've learned. I, I've, this is one of my favorite lessons in particular, because um, I've gotten some really amazing, amazing cartoons um, from students, uh, and it's really fun to see them sort of building on those analysis skills and then using it to make their own. So um, that is sort of the last way that I like to use political cartoons. As far as documents and primary sources go, um, I, I can't take a lot of credit. Uh, you know, I think some of the best teachers um, are ones who know when to borrow and when something is, is really good. So two of these lessons that I like to use are inquiry lessons from SHEG, the Stanford History Education Group. Um, if you're not familiar with them, it's they're a free resource um, out of Stanford University that really is, is building on um, a mix of so they, they're the ones I think they came out with a thinking like a historian curriculum that I think a lot of um, the New Haven curriculum sort of uh, takes the skills from. So sourcing, corroboration, contextualizing, um, those historical thinking skills come from the frameworks created by the Stanford History Education Group. And so they also have lessons that you can use. So I try to embed um, two of them to different degrees. I don't I don't usually use just um, like they, they would have what they would call turnkey um, lessons that you can use with 
primary source resources and, and PowerPoint slides and assignments. Um, I like to kind of just modify for where my kids are at um, and where I think they would where they would do best. But um, they're the sources that they have are phenomenal. So for this, um, these sources allow for inquiry in the sense that there's no real single answer that you you can be looking for. For example, this is a um, again I like this lesson because it starts with a piece of vis visual literacy. Um, when we talk about Ethiopian resistance, right, to um, Italian imperialism in, in particular, this is this picture that you have here is, uh, again, what do you see? What stands out to you? What do you notice? Uh, make an inference about what's going on. So obviously, student size is drawn to the person in the middle with the halo, the white horse surrounded by the colors of the Ethiopian flag. Um, but but every time I, I start a lesson with this picture, um, some student is going to find something new that that stands out to them, um, and it really generates a great class. And from there, those Shag sources go into um, a comparison of American textbooks and Ethiopian textbooks, right? So you're looking at what are students in each, and then um, so there's two American textbooks and an Ethiopian textbook, right? And students are asked to um come up with you know a claim evidence and analysis or claim evidence and, and warrant depending on whatever your school uses um to to argue the question of what led to ethiopia's victory over italy at the battle of adwa which was sort of the turning point what were the pictures shown here and so students have to sort of an, um, analyze reliability perspective again bias um evidence that's provided and come to the conclusion of what was it? It's different things, right? And I think it's really interesting. The Ethiopian textbook talks about sort of the the patriotic drive, the the fact that it was people fighting for their homeland, people fighting together, right? And you can even see in the picture, there's there's um, it looks like to be some women, right? It's women and men joining forces to help out, and then the um, and it's really they go into great detail about sort of the savviness of, of Emperor Menelik II and how he's kind of outplays these European leaders, which I think is a really interesting um, bend on sort of uh, a narrative in imperialism of like, well, they just duped all these local leaders and that's how they kind of took the land, right? And so um, I really like how this is sort of a counter narrative to that. But at the same time, um, looking at the American, the American textbook versions is like, Ethiopians found ways to get guns. You know, they had just had more, they just outgunned the Italians, and that's how they won. Whereas the Ethiopian version is like paragraphs about um, what what led it. And I think it's just an interesting look at, um, you know, it's a good way to sort of offer critiques for for certain textbooks as well, and 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 have students think about, okay, what are our textbooks maybe leaving out, um, or or what would we like to see? Um, and then again, another issue of, um, I think, successful resistance uh, is the Sepoy Rebellion um, that we would use in our, our Indian case study. Again, really interesting. You're hearing from British colonial officers in the army. You're hearing from uh, Indian royals, Indian soldiers, um, sort of talking, each giving different pieces about why is it that um, this group of, of Indians who were fighting on behalf of the British, um, what was it? You know, there's sort of a, the, the boilerplate um, explanation is often, well, the British were, they, they greased the cartridges um, with cow fat, right? And the sepoys are sort of a higher caste of um, Hindus. And that was, you know, it was a really big violation of their, um, of their religion, and so they they felt they felt disrespected and and a sort of attacked in that right, um, and so they fought back, right? But this lesson really goes much deeper, right? It was about um, issues of localities, right? Where they were in India, the the role they had in in certain um, in certain spaces within the colonial army as a sepoy, their pay. They were mad that they weren't getting raises, right? And so um, 
you know, then you also have a, a British officer sort of just saying like, oh, you know, they're hot tempered, right? And and sort of all these different different perspectives. And again, students can talk about all right, who do I think is the most reliable source here, right? Uh, who is, we'll never know what the what the exact reason was, um, but are we going to listen to the British colonial officer or are we going to listen to sort of a, an Indian historian writing 50 years later? So it's a good mix, I think, of primary and secondary sources. Um, it's a good mix of perspectives and it gives students an opportunity to practice historical writing um, so what I like about this unit is students are getting to show and develop these skills in different ways, right? They're making their own political cartoons. They're also writing short pieces of argumentative writing. Um, they're having class discussions with their peers, and we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. So another, another example um, for using primary sources um, is one that I have for the Opium Wars. So for the Boxer Rebellion, they're focusing really a lot on, on political cartoons. Um, in this one, uh, for the Opium Wars, we're using primary sources. Um, in particular, this, I love this, it's uh, called a letter of advice to Queen Victoria. So it's, it's from uh, one of the Chinese emperor's uh, main advisors, um, sort of writing on behalf here of, of the emperor, Basically, this is, it predates the Opium Wars a little bit, but talking about sort of the harm that these drugs are doing to China, sort of saying, listen, emperor to, to queen, you know, it's, look, this substance is illegal, you know what it's doing, right? It's illegal in, 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 in England. So why would you in, encourage the importation here in China? Um, and so... What I have is um, this letter. We sort of analyze it. We analyze the language of how, you know, again, bias, perspective. Um, and then I have students do for a formative assessment what I, I um, a tool that I picked up in my student teaching um, from my cooperating teacher is known as a raft. And the raft is, it allows for student choice, but, but within, you know, I, early in my in my teaching career, I fell into the trap of of infinite choice, right? And infinite choice is really no choice, especially for ninth graders. Um, they just sort of freeze and, and they need a little direction. So the raft format I find is really, really um, it allows for creativity. It allows for um, for some unique perspectives and students don't feel like they have to do one one thing. Um, and so what it is is, it raft is an acronym for role, audience, format, and topic. And so I'd say, okay, pick a role sort of within this, right? Are you a British merchant? Are you a member of the Chinese royal court? What's your role in this? Okay, and then who are you talking to? Um, you know, are you a just average Chinese citizen talking and then your audience, right? Who are you going to be talking to? So um, we sort of are using this historical document of in particular the letter of advice to Queen Victoria using this as an opportunity to um, practice some you know it's a good formative assessment the format is okay are you going to have a dialogue are you going to write a letter like the one you just read um, are you going to so there's like you know there's different ways to you know uh, uh, are you a member of the the you know, law, Chinese law enforcement trying to stop the smuggling, right? And so the, what format is that going to take? What is it going to look like? So a dialogue, um, a letter, uh, something like that. And then the topic, right? What are they talking about? Uh, so in particular, the member of the Chinese court, the topic is demanding that the, that uh, to the demanding the queen stop the importation of opium, right? Or merchants, how are we, the topic, how are we, you know, China, this is an illegal substance in China. How are we going to um, get around that, right? Or what are we going to do? Are we willing to fight for it? So it really is an, an opportunity, I think, for students to lean on the historical documents while also having a little creativity to show what they learn. Um, and again, like I said, the, the um, political cartoon is something that students really buy into and have a lot of fun with but the raft is, is good as well. And that's something you can use for, and you can use this for any unit, right? You can use this for, for anything. It's really um, transferable and I find students have a good time with it. 
Um, the last few ones that I have in terms of um, promoting student engagement, getting them around the room, having them talk to each other um, instead of, you know, a, a teacher led um, discussion is when we focus and we shift to Imperial Japan, um, we start by looking at first um, the, the Meiji Restoration, right? So, so we sort of are situating Japan um, and this transition from feudal Japan into Imperial Japan. Um, and so what I'll do is we have sort of a, a, a variety of different pictures of that sort of show this transformation, right? Um, and again, all of these are happening with with supported readings and you know other kind of modes of of um, of learning of student learning. But sort of the bulk of this would be to look at these and and again, the students are going to have a gallery walk. So um, gallery walks can look in, in a lot of different ways. Again, I'll I'll open this up. Um, this is a, a link just from Edutopia. Um, so it's a way to enliven class discussions. Um, I like to have, so I have the benefit of the, the entire back wall of my classroom and the entire front wall of my classrooms are floor to, I don't know, maybe eight feet whiteboards. So, and they're magnetic. Um, so what I do is I'll put a lot of those pictures around and um, I'll give students, you know, um, whiteboard markers and they can sort of write questions and respond to each other's questions and write about, again, think, what do you see? What is the first thing that your mind goes to, right? Um, what do you think of when you see this? Uh, uh, you know, what stands out to you? What questions do you have? And students can kind of write around the picture and it, and it allows students can respond to each other. And then we also will go back to whole group where we can sort of debrief and, and talk. So um, I like this, you know, there's different ways that you can do station to station, um, a chalk talk where, you know, students can write ideas down, question and answer, brainstorm. Um, and again, I can, I have them sort of do this on, on the whiteboards. So, um, and again, I find it to be, be very successful. Again, it's a way that, you know, even if even if you're you're maybe the reading you zoned out, right? Maybe the reading was at a level that was maybe just beyond you, right? Or or um, even if it's translated or whatever, these images can still sort of get the point across in a way, and that visual literacy supports um, textual literacy, right? And so you're developing these skills at the same time while giving students an opportunity to walk around the class, to engage with each other, um, to promote sort of higher order thinking and, and, and question development, all in the context of like, what I think is looking at some, some cool pictures of, of this transformation. Um, here we have Admiral Perry's Great White Fleet. Um, again, we're talking about this connection between imperialism and industrialization. Right. Um, we're looking at some early pictures here of, of, of Japanese factories. Um, we talk about sort of the resources that are available to Japan and, and a motivator for for imperialism. Right. They need they need resources. They want to expand their their power and influence. And meanwhile, you have the great white fleet of America knocking on your door saying time to open up. Right. Feudal Japan. You've sort of been in this in this um, your, your shell, so to speak, for hundreds of years, time to, to join the world. Um, and again, this is, these are building on each other. They're, they're sequential. The case studies, yes, they're standalone, you know, but they build on each other. So, you know, the opium that's coming from um, England is being grown in India in large parts, right? Um, you know, Japan is seeing what's happening to their neighbors um, when, they, when they refuse to open up Right, and so all of these are happening concurrently in in large part. But I also like that as case studies, they're kind of these neat little packages. Um, and depending on how much you want to sort of have them in conversation with each other, um, is really up to up to you. So that these are just some other images that I would use in in a gallery walk. Um, um, and again, so then we'd rely a little bit on on what does that mean um for the native people so here we have uh, a document that i, I pulled
pulled out is from a book, uh, Korea Trans Tradition and Transformation, where, again, I think these case studies allow for good, um, good analysis in, in terms of comparison and contrasting by looking at, all right, we know what imperialism looks like in Africa. We know what imperialism looks like in India. We know what imperialism looks like in China. Now that Japan is sort of getting in the game, trying to sort of mimic and, and emulate the Western powers, um, what does that mean for the people that then they are imperializing, in particular Koreans? Um, so we talk about the power of education, right? Of, of oh, you know, eliminating China, uh, Korean history. Right. The only history that you need to learn is 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 Japanese history, um, the elimination of names. Right. Elim literally eliminating the Korean identity to sort of um, fold them into the Japanese empire. Um, and so we look at these different examples. And, and um, again, what does this show? What does it sort of say about about? Japanese imperialism in Korea, and then on the flip side, what is, you know, based on what you've learned in these other case studies, why do you think they did this? How is this similar? Um, and it's kind of a nice way that as we're nearing our final summative assessment to sort of start thinking and pulling the threads of all those different case studies together into, into one. Um, and so, that was that's really it that that's my unit next um, tomorrow we'll talk about like what does this summative assessment look like. Um, so you know just just in recap, uh, I really like this unit in particular because um, i'm able to use visual literacy, both as sort of an opener and engaging hook a driver of the lesson and as a formative assessment. Um, and using different different documents and primary and, and secondary sources in conversation with each other really allows students ways to talk to each other, to develop their historical argumentation, um, and sort of have a little freedom and choice in how they show what they learned, which I think is always a good driver um, of student success.